Welcome to the latest and greatest episode. Actually, you know, they have been getting better and better. I listened to the one from yesterday, and it's really good. It's too bad nobody's listening to it. <laughs> Bodes well for this episode. Well, maybe, you know, one of these days we'll get a Grammy, but uh, for right now, we're just uh, sitting out here in the woods in Sri Lanka. <laughs> out in the boonies. Yep, talking about being and existence. And non-being. Well, it's not exactly non-being. I don't ever recall seeing the term non-being exactly. Except in, the, in, the, in relation to change of modes of being. Yeah, but that's, that's we're the, getting way ahead of ourselves to go into that. Hmm. Right now, you've been reading that chapter. Just unchanged. mentioning it, like I could tell, it's a little teaser, you know, for the crowds. Yeah, yeah. Being is always being. Either it's well, we'll get into issues of persistence of mm. being, huh? Uh, or change of being, so that everyone who is not enlightened is going to want their being to persist. And anyone who is enlightened is not laboring under the illusion that they have a solid, persistent, eternal being. Okay? So you have basically three kinds of people that we're talking about here. The Pratujana, the completely unenlightened, uninstructed, ordinary person. And then the student who is learning this process of enlightenment, the Buddhist teaching. Seka. <laughs> yes, and then the Aseka, the Arhant, mm. someone who has attained, who is completely free from false being and becoming. Yeah. Don't have the tendency to fabricate anything anymore. Right. Right. So, right now we're concentrating on talking about the Putujana because most people are Putujanas. Yeah. That's the, the default state of being in this universe. Mm. So, if you can hear this, this podcast, you are more than likely a Putujana. Yeah. And even a Seika, what he's dealing with is modifying his Putujana tendency. Yeah. So, it's important to know the structure of the Putujana's being and consciousness, the flow of awareness, how the experience is being processed. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we're going through Weti Muni's book, Buddha's Teaching and the Ambiguity of Existence, and taking each paragraph and commenting on it. And we're doing this not only for your benefit, we're doing it for our benefit, so we make sure we really understand it. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that's not clear, we look it up in the dictionary and like that. So, Even the suttas. You use the suttas a lot these days. Oh yeah, the suttas are very important. And this guy, Veti Muni, he, he relies heavily on the suttas. He doesn't stray too far away from the the Buddha's words. That's what I like about him. Mm. Yeah, he sticks to the source and he doesn't go too far away from it. When he does, it's when he goes into existential language to talk about or explain to himself how the Buddha's insight is correct or how it works. Mm. So, we're going to pick up from where we left off yesterday, where Wetimuni is saying, this being I, or existence of I, or remaining I, or persistence of I in time, is the most fundamental form of being in Pali Bhava. It is in fact the essence of what we refer to in ordinary language as existence, or being, in quotes. Hmm. Why is it in quotes? Because it's a fabrication. Ah. So, 
it's not the same kind of being as immediate experience. Yeah. We're not talking about experience here, we're talking about fabricated being, experience overlaid with some structure. Right, and that structure is something that we add, mm. that we actually put between us and our immediate experience. And we think that that's what we are. Yeah, that's, <laughs> what, that's what we think. Mm. But it's always changing, not continuously, but at least from when you were young to, to now, think about how much you can change. change any second. Mm. The Putujana, however, sees this state of affairs wrongly. First, he deceives himself into thinking that there is a subject existing independently of the object. That I is something existing independent of experience, and that experience is for this subject that it is mine. He thinks, because I am, things are for me. But according to the Buddha, actually, I exists because we see things as for me. Hmm. The concept I am brings in temporality, the perception of existing in time. This is very important. Because even though our existence is something, the existence as I, our being, quote-unquote, is something that we create, mm -hmm. the way in which we create it is completely different from the way we ordinarily perceive it. Mm -hmm. We went over the six stages of the Putujana's root structure. In fact, we're still on the chapter uh, on root structure. Mm -hmm. This is part of it. And what the Putujana does is take the immediate experience and then inject the conceit, I, into it mm. and identify with it. I experience, I thing. And then from there, he conceives from that thing or that experience an I, which is separate from it, mm. outside of it. But de define in terms of it. Of course, has to be. There is no I without an experience. Mm. There is no I without a sense object to base it on. And then he shifts the focus of attention subtly from the experience to the I, and then says, this experience, this thing is mine. That's how it's done. It's like a shell game. He hides the fact that he is projecting. He hides the fact that he is fabricating from himself. Hmm. He deceives himself, Wetimuni says, into thinking that there is a subject, that means a self, an I, existing independently of the object. Huh? But when he does that, he is in a state of identification with the object. Hmm. He is in the object. He says, in the one stage says he, he conceives in the experience. Mm. He conceives in X, whatever the thing is. And then the next stage is he conceives from X. What does he conceive? I. Mm. So at that point, the center of attention is still on the object, the experience. And then he creates the I from there. Mm. But then, the center of attention shifts to the I, the I. And then from the I, he says, this experience, this object, is for me. Hmm. It's mine, in other words. So, the I is always created with reference to some object, some experience, some object of the senses, now, whether gross or subtle. You can say, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> And in that, in that way, you create an I relative to the concept of being a Buddhist. Hmm. That's a mental object. Okay? So you can create an I in any different ways, many different ways, uh, according to the six sense spaces. But the point is, there is always a sense object at the root of I. Hmm. 
I cannot exist independently because I is always related to an object of the senses. Yeah. It's very clear. And you do that many times. I, 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 and then you remember it in the past and you plan it in the future and that's why you get the perception of existing in time. Yeah, he's going to go into that now. Hmm. We now come to two very important aspects of being. The perception of permanence, nichasanya, and the perception of pleasurableness, sukhasanya. Okay. Subjectivity, the conceits I, mine, and am, ahung, mama, and asmi. This subjectivity is always explicitly or implicitly structurally related with the perception of not passing away, navayo, hmm. of being permanent or immortal. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Death or non-existence is always the most repugnant perception to the Putujana's innermost being. Hmm. Huh? The Putujana hates the idea that he's going to pass away. He struggles against it. Even at the last stage, you know, hospitals and doctors make millions and millions of dollars. Prolonging life. Prolonging life that is really already finished. Even though immense amounts of suffering follow that, that oh, last. Oh, huge part. suffering. Yeah. And unnecessary suffering. Mm. If the person would just accept, okay, this is it, the body's falling apart, time to move on, mm. um, things would be a lot easier. But they have to struggle and spend enormous amount of resources to, to keep the old body going even for another couple of days. Uh, and there's tremendous suffering, tremendous indignities uh, inflicted upon the body. Um, in, in those kind of pastimes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's really horrible because... Tubes and hoses and chemicals. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and procedures and, and stuff that's really quite unnecessary. And usually the person dies anyway. Mm -hmm. And when they do, they're in some terrible state. Mm -hmm. um, but they feel they have to do that because they can't stand the idea of being impermanent. I just can't stand it. It's the most horrible thing uh, to the ego. Non-existence is the most threatening thing possible. Yeah, uh, because it's kind of, kind of a paradox because they give up their existence every night. Not only that, they give up their existence as soon as they see that whatever they're identifying with at the moment has become unpleasurable. Mm. And we'll they get see something more pleasurable. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that soon. Um, But, of course, they're doing that on their decision, whereas uh, the death of the body is a decision that they made a long time ago mm -hmm. when they took this body. Mm -hmm. uh, the death of a body is born along with its birth. <clears throat> so when you accept a human form, you also accept the inevitability of death. And there's nothing you can do about that. No. You've already made the decision. Mm. Okay, But that I has now gone away. And now you have a different eye that's attached to houses and relationships and things and positions and designations. Ideas. Yeah, mostly. It's mostly software. And the, the thought of giving that up is just unbearable. Hmm. And so they fight like anything against it. He says, notions of subjectivity, in other words, of I and self, are always associated with notions of permanence or immortality. Um, this, this is how every religion makes its dime, huh? by guaranteeing your immortality. <laughs> Just believe in me and you'll be saved. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Just pay money. Yeah, tithe and like that. But it's actually, it's... One label of I slapped on one experience and one label of I slapped on the next experience. Yeah, and those experiences can come several in a second. Mm. But just like the frames of a movie giving the illusion of smooth motion, the uh, 
continuously created I gives the illusion of a continuing individuality. Mm. Well, we're, this is the part of the text that deals with this, so let's just yeah. go on. Uh, okay, the conception of the individual as I requires this notion of permanence, even though the permanence of I is by no means established. Reflection on experience indicates reflection. this. Uh, reflection, sorry. <laughs> as follows. In the present experience, there is the notion of I, and the experience, or a part of it, is itself identified with that which is I. This present experience is presently regarded as continuing in a very subtle manner. And even if this present particular experience is seen to pass away, experience in general is not thought to cease immediately altogether. When the present experience gives way to another, the subsequent experience is also then identified as that which is I. Hmm. In other words, whenever this experience identified as I passes away, there is always another experience to be identified as I. So, the Putujana never thinks that I ceases altogether immediately with the cessation of the present experience. He thinks that there is always I. <laughs> But really, it's like I, 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 mm. I, 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 And sometimes there is experience without the I. That can happen. Like you see something really beautiful, like a sunset or something, and then you forget yourself. Yes. And you, you're just there Good without point. thinking. And people crave those kind of experiences. Mm. Isn't it? They remember and, that because then yeah. they, they were experiencing the whole thing without the filter. Yeah. A moment of wonder. Mm. Buddha does calls that a pre-taste of Nirvana. Yes. Right. For a moment or a few minutes, I cease to exist. We also brought up the point of when somebody is functioning at a very high level in a sport yeah. or a performance or, or something. Flow. Yeah, when they're in the flow. Mm. Right? The immediate experience is there, mm. but this layer of of I creation and mm. mind creation goes away. Yeah. And there's nothing in between you and the experience. Even the skills acquired are still there, but the I is gone. Now, that's really interesting. It's really interesting to note that the skills, and when you're practicing a skill, the I is certainly there. Mm. Uh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to practice that, and mm. now I'm going to do this again and get it right. If you really get into it, though, the I disappears right. at, at the level of mastery. That's the point. And people crave those experiences. They glorify the people who are in those states of experience because of their competence. Huh? It takes getting rid of that layer, additional layer of software, to reach the highest level of competence in any kind of performing art. And we know this, and we glorify it, being in the groove, mm -hmm. huh? being in the zone, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So that experience is a little foretaste of enlightenment mm. which is why the, the buddha i think one of the reasons why the buddha praises skillfulness so much yes. the very act of becoming skillful at anything requires that you give up at, at some certain point you give up this whole superstructure of eye making mm. you just forget about it mm. you, and you get into the experience completely the Patujana occasionally muses that experience will cease altogether, that is, he will die, but only as time goes on some years in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but this happening some time later is a vague concept, corresponding to a far remote actuality, remaining untouched by and completely separate from both the present experience and the immediately following experience. Thus, the Putujana, even when he muses that he will die, never thinks that he will die right now, at this instant, or even at the next. Uh, remember when we were studying Heidegger? Heidegger talks about death being apprehended as something imminent. Hmm. Huh? 
something that you can't even really experience because once you die there's no, you're no longer there but you you should taste that imminent feeling of death well that's a good thing mm. yeah because it moves you to become more authentic mm. i don't know if everyone has that experience when they're young but i remember i had a really powerful experience with that tell me about it it was this music video about this guy He was like standing in this this dark basement with chains hanging down and he was singing I wasn't dead, I was just asleep. So he was like buried alive. It's like heavy metal from the 80s. Oh, so, one of those dark fantasies. <laughs> yeah, and that got me really thinking about death. You know, I was hmm. like three years old, I guess. Three years yeah, old? Three, four years old. Wow. So for a couple of weeks there, I was like really deep into death. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I think every young person at some stage of their life has to confront death. Mm. Maybe a, a favorite pet dies or a member of the family dies. Yeah. You know. And then they have to deal with this, what is death? Mm. And usually they wind up rationalizing it as something that's going to happen in a long time from now. Mm. And certainly not to me. <laughs> maybe somebody else. Mm. And maybe the parents have some preconceived idea of what's going to happen. Like, Jesus is going to save you. Everything is going to be all right. Yeah, I'm not going to die. Jesus is going to save me. Mm. Really, people think like that. Yeah. Um, remember in the Bhagavad Gita, there's that painting of the devotee swimming in the ocean mm. and Krishna is coming down on Garuda and, and yes. scooping him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, you're not going to die. Krishna's going to save you. Huh. Uh, something's going to save you. Well, it certainly has appeal. It has the appeal of being excused from dealing with a difficult subject. Yeah. I don't have to deal Being with authentic about it. Mm. See, oh, we don't have to deal with it. You know, God's going to take care of everything. It's easy. It's convenient. And remember, convenience is a selling point that can get people to invest enormous resources mm. uh, or adopt enormous illusions about something just because it's convenient. Uh, like it's convenient to, to uh, communicate with your friends on Facebook. Mm. Well, now Facebook knows everything you're doing. Yeah. And of course, they're monitored by the government and so on. You know, so you, you give up your privacy, you give up so much of your autonomy hmm. um, for convenience. Uh, for Google, Google can, they say they're now in the position where they can predict what people are going to search for. <laughs> <laughs> they know before you do what you're going to search for next. <laughs> Seriously. And they queue it up, you know, huh. they put it up. Uh, they get it loaded on their servers so they can respond quickly. <laughs> See? All in the name of convenience. Wow. Now, I can easily find out anything I want to know. So what do I want to know? Why do I have this persistent cough? Right? So then somebody, some software at Google is going to load uh, remedies for pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> From the pharmaceuticals companies of course not from Ayurveda right <laughs> of course they have their bias everyone has their bias huh? the Christian's bias is that Jesus is going to save me the devotee's bias is that Krishna is going to save me or whatever form of God I believe in mm. this week and the point is that they're using this as a convenience to evade dealing with death directly Because the very subject is so repugnant, so uncomfortable for most people. See, and, and this is where the teaching of the Buddha is so different, so special and unique. Because he deals with the subject of death directly. Mm. Mm. He says that, first of all, this I of yours doesn't really exist. You're creating it mm. artificially. In the first place. Yep. So where there's no... I that's going to die. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, this creation is impermanent by nature because it's dependent upon a certain sense experience. And those experiences are all temporary. Mm. 
their coming into beings persisting for some time and passing away. Uh, so we deal with death actually all the time. Yeah. And most people deal with it by just creating another false existence, mm -hmm. another false I. Yeah. But the Buddha says, no, learn how to die. Die permanently mm -hmm. uh, before the body death. And then when death comes, it'll be easy. You're already there. You already know what it's like because you've already let go that process of I making, my making. So there's nothing to die. And the experience of walking around in the, in the world without giving birth to eyes all the time is... That's what we want because that's the ultimate... It's called the ultimate happiness. Yes, we've, we've been experiencing that a little bit, mm. playing around with that a little bit here. We have a very supportive atmosphere um, to work with that concept and to experiment with it. And what we're getting out of that is that it's much more pleasurable. Even we can do all kinds of work, like we made that flower bed yesterday. Mm. you know, And there was less and less concept of I getting in the way. Only when we had to make decisions. Mm. Well, are we going to make it three by four or five by seven or how, you know, how big are we going to make it? Then and, the egos come to yeah. the floor. <laughs> no, I think. <laughs> it should be done uh, this way, not that way. <laughs> and then we're ready to argue the case, yes. right? <laughs> So anyway, thus I, quote unquote, <laughs> the false I, is always implicitly thought to continue, to remain, to be, to exist, to persist in time in one way or another. Mm. That's what all those words mean, to be, to exist, contains the concept of time, yeah. persistence in time. This perception of being by itself becomes firm at the level where the experience is taken to be for I, stage five of our six-stage hierarchy. Here, separation of I from the immediate experience is explicit, apparent, and repeatedly taking successive experiences as for I more explicitly reinforces the concept of an I that stands separate from all existence. Hmm. I against the world. I did it my way. Huh? Show me your I. Yeah. That's the thing. If, if you actually examine this phenomenon, you'll find that it's just smoke and mirrors. <laughs> It's, it's a label, it's, it's, a, it's a fabrication, it's a determination that's that slapped on top of the experience. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you have a sticker and you, you put it on the experience, I. I, mine. Mine, mine, this, that. So, hey, oh, Robert, did I tell you that story about Yoko Ono? Mm. Well, I'll tell I it again for the podcast. About it. Yeah, that, uh, when was this? Must have, must have been 1966 in uh, Woodstock, New York. I went to, I played in a band at this uh, 4th of July party at a, at a hippie place, hippie commune, hippie art center. Yeah. And uh, Yoko Ono was there driving around in a yellow VW bug. And in the back seat, she had several boxes of these little round yellow stickers. Huh? They were probably actually, you know, price stickers, like you would put on a product in a store huh. and write the price on it. Hmm. Hmm? Anyway, her art event was going around and sticking these stickers on everything. I mean, you'd find them on doors, windows, in closets, you know, everywhere. This was her thing, marking her turf, you know, like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Did you try, try to put one on your flute? I wouldn't let her get close to my <laughs> flute. Are you kidding me? She's such a weirdo. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mine. You know, talk about a sociopath. But anyway, <laughs> these people want to stick their little stickers on every experience that comes along mm. and make it mine 
you yeah. know. And we talked about greed yesterday. We talked about egotism and how people will assign I and mine to things that they really have no claim to, hmm. no right to, you know, and that this is egotism. This is a sociopathy. This is a kind of sickness, a greed for existence, so acute that the person is, is ready to steal, is ready to take what's not given as I. And then many people put the mind label on the same object and we got a war. There you go. Let's fight over it. Uh, and this is considered, you know, a, a pastime. This mm. is a, a way of life. It's normal. For many people. Well, it's normal in the sense that it's common. It's average. But it's not normal in the sense of what is a f uh, self-realized, what is an intelligent or a truly human, human being. Hmm. It's, it's a disease. Yeah. A healthy human being doesn't do that. That's correct. And why? The Putujana thinks that somehow or other, because of the apparent continuity given by the repeated superimposition on each experience of the notion that the experience is for I, that I stands as a by itself, The consequence of this whole state of affairs is that it leads the Putujana to the subtle belief that there actually is a permanent I standing by itself, apart from all experience. That I am, irrespective of all else. No matter what happens, I am. Huh? Can't find it, but I am. Right, somewhere. can't show it to anybody, can't prove it, even to myself. <laughs> This subtle belief grips the Patujana because he is completely unaware of what is happening and does not notice the complex superstructure that lies beneath and supports I. So, because people don't look into these things, they have no idea. And the, the superstructure is sufficiently complicated that without either... Uh, tremendously acute self-observation or the instruction of somebody of, of superior intelligence like the Buddha, you would never guess that it was there. You'd just go on with the same old thing. Mm. Uh, and it's a matter of uh, monkey see, monkey do. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is trying to uh, inflate their false egos to the max. So I guess I should do it too. I was criticizing the, the 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 experience of most people to my to my journalist friend. Oh. And his response was that he thought that most people had a pretty good idea of who they were. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. Everyone thinks like that. Yeah. Oh, I know who I am. Yes. Don't you tell me what I'm doing. I I'm the, I'm the guy who likes this and this and this and don't like all that. Exactly. You know, we talked about that as a, the freedom, you know, as in free choice or as in a free country. Huh? The freedom really boils down to which color or style of toilet paper you're going to buy in the supermarket. <laughs> you know, it really boils down to that. Yeah. There are all these choices and you think, oh, I can choose, you know, the, the I'm a man. So I'm not going to choose the fluffy pink toilet paper. No. <laughs> Can and I choose? choose Manchester United. Arsenal is just crap. Manchester United is the thing. What's that? Football teams. Oh, teams. <laughs> Sports. So many people define themselves through stuff like that. Tribal yes. Yes. tendency. Or the video game that you're addicted to. Mm -hmm. huh? I'm a World of Warcraft guy. I'm a warlock. <laughs> I'm a mage. <laughs> no, you're not. You're a nerd. <laughs> Cowering in your parents' basement, yes. hiding from life. Why? Because people don't want to look into these issues. They do not want to pry apart the rationalizations they use. They they want to go on. At, it's like like a black box mentality, huh? You just plug in this black box and that fixes it. Hmm. Don't look inside. You don't want to know how it works. <laughs> But it's like that. It's like people don't want to look too closely 
at the rationalizations that underlie their sense of identity. It's really inconvenient. Well, yeah, because if you do that, you can't do much of anything else while you're doing it. It demands so much attention and so much highly focused awareness. And it's a little bit painful before it starts getting blissful. Uh, well, yeah, you, you have to agree that, or uh, admit that, this is bullshit. <laughs> what I've been doing, this identity that I've created, it's it's just propped up by, in air, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not solid. It doesn't have any real solid basis in fact. It's just something that I'm postulating. But most people are too proud to see that. They're proud of their eye that they constructed. Or they have a, a whole, uh, they invent a whole rationalization of this postulating hmm. and why this is a good thing. Yeah. I'm becoming, uh, I'm, I'm in, engaged in a voyage of self-discovery. Uh -huh. <laughs> they make it heroic and uh -huh. so, sounds really attractive, you know. Werner Earhart, for example. Uh -huh. I mean, his stuff is really useful as far as climbing the organizational ladder and transforming your ego into whatever it has to be to function in a, a structured environment, you know. Um, but when you start to inquire deeply into the mechanism of how this works, you find that it's actually dependent origination. Mm. The it's context the same. is decisive. What kind of stuff you put in to your experience, that's the kind of stuff that yeah. comes out. Yeah, creating context and changing the context to get the kind of I that you want or that's mm. appropriate in the situation. Yeah. But the point is, you're still creating the I. The context, yeah. The, the, the it I. leads to a certain type of being. Mm. Uh -huh. And that's going on. That process is unexamined. That process is subconscious. That process is mechanical. Mm. That eye making and mind making. Mm. Huh? We can even utilize it. We can even manipulate it to get the results that we want mm. without looking into the actual mechanism itself. Yeah. And that's what people like Earhart have done. That's what Scientology has done. Scientology has taken it to the level of a high art mm. uh, to manipulate being without actually looking into the, the mechanism. mechanism of being itself. And there's always an eye in the intention. So right. So there will always be an eye in the output. I will exist as an OT <laughs> forever. Uh, and then they wonder why they're pulling in all kinds of Karma? Uh, karma, terrible things happening to these OT. The average lifespan of an OT is 57 years. Huh. That's like almost 20 years less than the national average lifespan of 75. Hmm. Something's going on. More, the more being you gather, the more, the more you suffer, probably. Yeah, the more you pull in stuff like cancer and stuff like... You Enemies... Know, yeah, enemies, right. There's a lot of infighting in that group. Hmm. Why? They're all competing for these higher states of being. Uh, and it gets like that. Uh, look what happened, uh, you know, in the devotees. The devotees are supposed to be into love and all this stuff, hmm. you know. But they're the most vicious infighting group I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. You know, why are so-called religious people so vicious? Why are the conservative Christians... You know, in favor of the death penalty, for example. Hmm. You know, they want people to die. Uh, because they are in competition for the longevity of their eye. Mm -hmm. See, and one of the ways to, to get that longevity is to get rid of the other eyes that are competing for existence. It's it's vicious. It's, yeah. it's animal consciousness, actually. Yeah. Well... We're running out of time, and it's getting late. Uh, so un unless we have a really important comment, then we're going to leave the rest to next time. 
But basically, we're going to continue to discuss this for several episodes, this business of permanence and pleasurableness, because they are critical, especially to the point where we change our eye, where we change our state of being, uh, where we uh, change the experience or the perception that our eye rests on from one to another. Mm. Uh, so we're going to go into that in some detail as a uh, food for self-observation. Mm -hmm. 